In a quiet corner of a country churchyard in Norfolk lies the grave of Harold Davidson, the last resting place of a man who, in the 1930s, was central to a case that scandalised the Church of England and caused a press furore. He was a cleric who strayed beyond his brief and was found guilty by a consistory court and sensationally defrocked in 1932 after a trial that gripped the nation. This is the scandal of the Vicar of Stiffkey. Harold Davidson was born in Showling near Southampton on the 14th of July 1874 to the Reverend Francis and Alice Davidson. The father was the vicar of the nearby St Mary's Church, posts he had held since 1866, and the family came from a long line of Anglican clergy that could count 27 members in holy orders, and their son was expected to follow in the family tradition. He was educated at Bannister Court School, which was initially set up for sons of merchant navy officers. In 1890, he was sent to stay with two maiden aunts in Croydon and became an enthusiastic amateur actor. He became a part-time worker at Toynbee Hall, a famous East End charity. His real love was the theatre and consequently his schoolwork suffered and he failed to get into Oxford University to study for holy orders. As you can imagine, his parents were aghast that he wanted to tread the boards. He was a reasonably competent comic actor and was able to tour provincial theatres and he is best remembered for his role as Lord Fancourt Baverley in The Fast Charlie's Aunt. He led an uneventful life, being a teetotaler and giving Bible readings to the elderly and needy whilst touring. He finally acceded to the family's wishes and the Davidson family were able to tap their contacts within the Anglican Church. They persuaded Basil Wilberforce, grandson of the famous William Wilberforce, to use his influence to enable their son to attend Exeter College, Oxford, to study for holy orders. He proved to be an indifferent and unreliable student, and kept failing his exams. He led a rather eccentric life, and it was noted that his room was decorated with autographs of leading actresses of the day. He appeared on stage when he could. He had to leave the college in 1901 due to his academic inadequacies. He was sent to a crammer called Grindles Hall and managed to pass the exams at the age of 28. The Bishop of Oxford reluctantly ordained him in 1903, seeing Davidson as a most unlikely candidate for holy orders. But one incident in November 1894 is very pertinent to this story. On a very foggy night, he was walking along the Thames embankment and came across a 16-year-old girl about to commit suicide by throwing herself into the river. She had run away from her home in Cambridge and was without money or shelter. He took pity and paid for her fair home. He later said that her pitiful story made a tremendous impression on him and that he had ever since kept his eyes open for opportunities to help that type of person. When an attractive leading Irish actress by the name of Molly Sorin visited Oxford with a travelling theatre company, Davidson fell in love with her and they were quickly engaged. It was a stormy relationship and terminated on several occasions. But his real problem was money, or rather a lack of it. Unless he could secure a decent parish, he could not get married. His first church appointment was as a curate at Holy Trinity Church in Windsor, with an additional role as assistant chaplain to the household cavalry. In 1905, he ended up in London as a curate to St Martin's in the Field, where his energy and hard work drew many approving comments. His big break came in 1906, 
through the patronage of the sixth Marquis Townsend, with his appointment as rector to the Norfolk parish of Stiffkey. Whilst working as a curate at St Martin's in London, he had officiated the wedding of Gladys Southurst to the Marquis in 1905. In this way, he was able to secure a suitable parish. With this desirable position, he now had the use of 60 acres of church land, a large Georgian rectory, and an initial income of £503, rising to £800 over the years. At the time, it was surrounded by salt marshes, being close to the coast, and had an impoverished population of around 350 people. He got on well with his parishioners, who nicknamed him Little Jimmy, on account of his small stature of five feet and three inches. But his relations with the upper echelon of society, however, was not so cordial, as he rebuked the main landowner, Colonel Groom, for keeping a mistress. On the 9th of October 1906, now settled into a prosperous living, Davidson was able to marry Molly Sorin. The rectory became a family home, as children were born at regular intervals. Apart from his parochial and domestic responsibilities, Davidson quickly adopted the habit of spending much of the week in London, engaged in various kinds of social work, and became involved with a number of charities, one of which was the Actors' Church Union, based in Covent Garden, for whom he became the chaplain, and was frequently to be found backstage in London's theatres, ministering to the needs of the showgirls, sometimes with an unwelcome degree of persistence. Between 1910 and 1913, he expanded this work to Paris, to which he made regular visits. Sometimes he acted as a chaperone for dancers, recruited by the Folies Bergère. Many of the out-of-work and would-be actresses were invited to stay at the Stiff Key Rectory, sometimes as many as twenty at a time, to the consternation of his wife Molly, and of some of the local establishment, who feared for the morals of local farmhands. Among the most disapproving of Davidson's conduct was Major Philip Hammond, a church warden at Morston, who later became Davidson's principal adversary. Every week he would take the first train down to London on Monday and the last train back to Stiffkey on Saturday. His curate as deputy would handle all parish affairs in his absence until parishioners chose to alter their wishes to suit his timetable. It was quipped that if a person died on a Monday in hot weather, the corpse would decompose by the time the vicar returned to bury it. Davidson was 39 years old at the outbreak of war in 1914. In 1915, possibly to escape the increasingly turbulent atmosphere at the Stiffkey Rectory, he joined the Royal Navy as a chaplain. He began his service on HMS Gibraltar, a depot ship based in the Shetland Islands, where he irritated his shipmates by calling church parades every time another ship visited the anchorage. He had the full approval of the base commander, Vice Admiral Sir Reginald Tupper, who was known as Holy Reggie. Davidson's service report records that he performed his duties in a perfunctory manner, and is not on good terms with messmates, disregards mess rules and regulations. In 1916, Davidson joined HMS Fox in the Middle East and shortly afterwards was arrested by the naval police during a raid on a Cairo brothel. He explained that he was looking for a diseased prostitute who had been infecting his men. Again, his commanding officer's reports were negative. However, Davidson remained until August 1918, when he was posted to HMS Leviathan in the North Atlantic. Here, his commander was slightly more complimentary, and found him a clever writer and entertainer who pays attention to duty. Davidson eventually left the Navy in March 1919. When he returned home, 
he found that Molly was six months pregnant. The dates of his service leave during 1918 made it apparent that he was not the father, and a daughter was born in June. The likely father was a Canadian army colonel, Ernest Dudemain, a friend from Davidson's school days, who had lodged at the rectory in the latter part of 1918. Although deeply upset by his wife's infidelity, he accepted the child. To escape the tense atmosphere in Stiffkey, he applied for a year's posting as a chaplain to a hill station at Simla in India, but the opportunity fell through. Instead, he resumed his pre-war routine of spending his week in London. Sometimes, through a misrail connection or other mishap, he was barely in time for the Sunday morning service, and sometimes he would fail to arrive at all. According to his own estimate, Davidson approached around 150 to 200 girls a year over a period of 12 years. His activities usually centred on the numerous tea shops and their waitresses. Many rejected his advances and a number of tea shops considered him a pest and barred him. Landladies took exception to his habit of visiting their female tenants at all hours of the night. There is little evidence that he behaved indecently or molested the girls. He bought them tea, found them rooms, listened to their problems and sometimes found them work on the stage or in domestic service. He styled himself as a prostitute's padre and asserted to his bishop that this was the proudest title that a true priest of Christ can hold. To meet the costs of his lifestyle, Davidson needed more money than his parish could provide. He needed to improve his financial position when, in about 1920, he met Arthur Gordon, supposedly a wealthy American theatre company promoter, but in reality an undischarged bankrupt and confidence trickster. Gordon not only persuaded Davidson to invest his savings in a range of dubious schemes, but also got him to solicit funds from other investors. Davidson borrowed heavily and by 1925 was in serious financial difficulties. In February of that year, he failed to pay his local rates and was threatened with imprisonment. He avoided this by borrowing from moneylenders at exorbitant interest rates, but in October was forced to file a petition for bankruptcy with debts totalling £2,924. Eventually a settlement was reached, whereby around half of his stiff key stipend was applied to the reduction of his debts. Somehow, he managed to continue his London life. He never stopped believing in Gordon's essential honesty, and was certain that one day his investments would pay off. Although many of Davidson's parishioners accepted that his London mission was entirely honourable, some were less convinced. Major Hammond, the church warden, was suspicious of the stream of visitors that Davidson brought to the Stiff Key Rectory and thought he was neglecting his parochial duties. In 1927, relations between the two men worsened when Davidson berated the Major for clearing the ground in the Morstone churchyard. On one occasion, Davidson arrived late at church to officiate at a communion service, having forgotten the bread and wine. Enraged, Hammond ordered him back to the rectory to collect it. An even greater lapse, in Hammond's eyes, was Davidson's failure to return to Stiffkey in time to officiate at the 1930 Armistice Day ceremony at the local war memorial. Early in 1931, advised by a cousin who was a priest, Hammond made a formal complaint against Davidson to the Bishop of Norwich, citing the rector's supposed behaviour with women in London. Under the provisions of the Clergy Discipline Act of 1892, members of the church could be prosecuted in a consistory court 
for immoral acts and, if convicted, face punishments ranging from temporary suspension to full defrocking from holy orders. The bishop was initially reluctant to prosecute Davidson, but was advised by his legal counsel, Henry Dashwood, that the case should proceed. In search of evidence, Dashwood hired a private inquiry agent who soon found one of the women in question and persuaded her to sign a statement detailing her 10-year association with Davidson. The statement contained little indication of any intimate relationship. Inquiries continued for many months. The bishop was initially reluctant to pursue the case and Davidson thought he might be prepared to replace the charges with a letter one of indiscipline. In February 1932, Dashwood advised the bishop that the matter could not be suppressed in any way. Allegations had been printed in the evening news, and the story had been picked up by other papers, whose lurid headlines had created much public interest. On the 7th of February, the bishop received a letter from a 17-year-old woman, Barbara Harris which contains specific allegations of immoral conduct against Davidson, and promised more, claiming that she knew lots of things against him that might help, and that he had the keys of a lot of girls' flats and front doors. Davidson's lawyers failed to identify some obvious differences between the handwriting in the letter and other examples of Harris's writing a factor which might have affected the impact of her subsequent testimony to the court. A consistory church court, one that does not have a jury, was convened on the 29th of March 1932. Davidson was accused of associating with women of loose character and accosting, molesting, importuning young females for immoral purposes. The prosecution's case was in the hands of a high-profile legal team. Davidson, meanwhile, engaged experienced lawyers to defend him, funding this partly through the sale of newspaper stories. Because of the level of press interest and the number of London-based witnesses involved, the court sat in Church House Westminster rather than in Norwich. A summary account of Davidson's life in London was presented and the witness box saw a succession of landladies, waitresses, and other women, all of whom confirmed Davidson's habitual pestering without making any serious accusation of misconduct. When Davidson himself took to the stand, he was said to be light-hearted and even flippant while his disastrous finances were aired. He took great offence when his association with Gordon was presented as a partnership in crime. The evidence from witnesses at the tea rooms, shop girls, ladies of the night or landladies, did not amount to a defrocking sentence. His cause was severely damaged when the prosecution gave the court two photographs taken in the rectory of a teenage bare-bottomed actress called Estelle Douglas. Davidson was a close friend of her mother, whom he had helped get on the stage 20 years previously. Davidson, who was broke at the time, agreed £50 to help in a photo shoot of the 15-year-old in a bathing costume. Whilst he was out of earshot, the photographer asked her to remove her clothes and just wear a shawl, hence the bare bottom in the photograph. The vicar explained that the picture had been intended as a publicity shot to help the girl find work as an actress. He protested that he had been set up and did not know she was naked under her shawl and he thought she was wearing a bathing suit, as she had been in an earlier photograph. On the 6th of June, after closing speeches from both sides, the court adjourned until July to allow the presiding chancellor, who alone would determine the outcome, to consider the evidence. During the court proceedings, Davidson continued to officiate at Stiffkey and Morstan, although his erratic attendance meant that substitutes often had to be arranged. 
On the 21st of June 1932, the Reverend Richard Cattrall arrived to officiate at the evening service in Stiffkey. He had just begun when Davison entered the church and attempted to seize the Bible. The two wrestled with the book for some seconds before Cattrall yielded, telling the congregation, As nothing short of force will prevent Mr. Davison from taking part, I can see nothing left to do but to withdraw. Crowds of reporters and sightseers at weekends led the Archdeacon to issue a statement deploring the media circus and asking that the full spirit of worship be restored to Sunday services. On the 8th of July, the verdict was announced. Davidson was guilty on five counts of immorality. The sentence would be determined by the bishop, and in the meantime, the disgraced vicar was entitled to seek leave to appeal to the Privy Council. Sorely in need of funds to meet his continuing legal expenses, Davidson reverted to his early career as a stage entertainer. In July, he made his debut with a variety act at the Prince's Cinema in Wimbledon and later toured the provinces until, possibly dissuaded by pressure from church authorities, theatres declined to book him. He then continued his public performances by appearing in a barrel on Blackpool Seafront, where thousands paid to observe him through a small window, although not everyone was impressed. To the consternation of the church warden and some parishioners, the bishop delayed issuing an instruction forbidding Davidson to preach. When the church doors were locked to prevent him entering, the vicar preached to a large congregation on the grass outside the church. In August, Davidson's license to minister as a priest was revoked. His last service was morning worship at Stiffkey on the 21st of August 1932, when around a thousand people congregated outside the church. That afternoon, he demanded the church keys from Hammond, the church warden, who sent him on his way by turning him round and administering a substantial kick. Hammond was later fined for this assault. The consistory court reconvened for sentencing in Norwich Cathedral in October. Davidson was allowed briefly to address the court. He admitted that his behaviour had been indiscreet, but regretted none of his actions, and proclaimed his innocence. Bishop Pollock delivered the most severe sentence available, that of deposition, stating, We do thereby pronounce, decree and declare that the said Reverend Harold Francis Davison, being a priest and deacon, ought to be entirely removed, deposed and degraded from the said offices. Davison was, as a consequence, defrocked. As the ceremony ended, he made a furious, impromptu speech, denouncing the sentence and declaring his intention to appeal to the Archbishop. He was also charged £8,205 in costs. He was ruined financially and professionally. His only recourse was to return to Blackpool and resume his career as a showman for the next four years, interrupted by occasional prosecutions for obstruction and a nine-day spell in prison in 1933 for non-payment of rent owing to one of his former landladies. Although the Barrel Act remained his staple performance, he introduced variations over the years. Freezing in a refrigerated chamber, or being roasted in a glass-fronted oven, while a mechanised devil prodded him with a pitchfork. In August 1935, the freezing routine led to Davidson's arrest and prosecution for attempted suicide. He won the case and was awarded £382 in damages for false imprisonment. It is said that on his release, he was in an open-top horse-drawn carriage, and that the Reverend was flanked by two young negresses who threw flowers to an enthusiastic crowd. How much money Davidson made from his various acts is uncertain. Off-season he worked sporadically, 
at one time as a door-to-door book salesman, and on another as a porter at St Pancras Station. He could not avoid press attention, as in November 1936 he was arrested and fined, pestering two 16-year-old girls at Victoria Station. He had approached them, offering auditions for a leading role in a West End show. He was prosecuted in the magistrate's court for trespassing on railway property. Despite pleading that he was framed, he was fined 40 shillings and costs of just over two pounds. That same month, he interrupted a church assembly at Central Hall, Westminster, at which the Archbishop of Canterbury was present. Davison was prevented from addressing the meeting, at which he dropped numerous copies of a pamphlet titled I Accuse, in which he listed his grievances and castigated the church's hierarchy. By 1937, interest in Davidson's Blackpool sideshows was waning, and for that summer, he accepted an invitation to join the self-styled Captain Fred Rye's animal-themed show in the East Coast resort of Skegness. He considered this a step upwards from what he termed the blatant vulgarities of Blackpool. Davidson's act consisted of a ten-minute address delivered outside a cage containing two lions, after which he would enter the cage and spend a few minutes with them. This required courage on Davidson's part, because he was fearful of animals. The act was billed as Daniel in a Modern Lion's Den, and attracted large audiences, including a significant number of clergy. On the 28th of July 1937, at the evening performance, Davidson gave his usual speech before entering the cage in which the lion, Freddy, and Lioness Toto were sitting quietly. Then, according to reports, in scarcely credible terms, the little clergyman from Norfolk and the lion acted out the classical Christian martyrdom to the full. Eyewitnesses later reported that after Davidson had cracked his whip and shouted, he stepped on Toto's tail, and Freddy became agitated and knocked Davidson over, before seizing him in his mouth by the head and running around the cage with him. The lion tamer struggled to pacify the snarling Freddy, who eventually dropped the stricken Davidson, enabling him to drag the victim to safety. He was badly mauled and had suffered a broken neck. The coroner's verdict was death by misadventure. In Skegness, Rye saw Davison's death as a business opportunity, and crowds flocked to see the actual lion that mauled and caused the death of the ex-rector of Stiffkey. The now-deceased vicar's wife Molly's financial situation was desperate, and her family applied to the church authorities for help, and eventually she received grants from two church charities. She died in a Dulwich nursing home in 1955. Of the other major participants in the legal case, Pollock remained as Bishop of Norwich until his resignation in 1942. Davidson's children disappeared from public view after the trial. Friends and well-wishers covered the expenses of the funeral, which took place on the 3rd of August in Stiffkey. A large crowd of around 3,000 people were in attendance. Onlookers unable to get into the churchyard found vantage points on nearby walls, roofs and trees. When the headstone was put in place, it contained a line from Robert Louis Stevenson. For on faith in man, and genuine love of man, all searching after truth must be founded.